Hello, and thank you all for coming to the U.S. Embassy Annual Conference, Smart People for a Smart Economy. Uh, this is the Future Classrooms session, uh, and I, uh, I was uh, over here during the morning, but I saw a number of tweets regarding um, timekeeping in the main <laughs> session. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to endeavor to do the same here. So this is an hour-long session. Um, I would encourage you to uh, tweet about this uh, session uh, using the hashtag SMART14. And uh, so with that, I'm going to introduce our moderators for this panel. And there will be time for question and answers at the very end. So if you think of something um, while, while the speakers are talking, uh, just hold your question to the end and there will be, be time for questions. So with that, um, I'm going to introduce uh, Jake Rowan Byrne and Roisin Crawford. Um, Jake is the Computer Science and STEM uh, Teacher Training Program Manager at Bridge 21. Bridge 21 is a really cool organization. Um, it's kind of an innovative learning environment in its own right. Um, and it tries to uh, teach this, it gives this uh, new innovative model uh, both to teachers and uh, to students through, through workshops and other events that they organize. And Roisin Crawford uh, is the founder of an organization called STEM Aware. And STEM Aware, uh, th uh, they organize a number of workshops that encourage uh, students uh, to have a really positive experience around STEM uh, subjects. And it encourages these students then to, to take up the study of STEM topics. Um, and then ultimately, hopefully, find careers uh, utilizing these skills. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Roisin. Thank you and good afternoon everybody. So I'm going to just read out everybody's lovely, wonderful bio. Very important people in my hand here. Um, so Steve Duggan, if you give me a wave so everybody knows who you are. Uh, Steve is a member of the Education Strategy in Microsoft's worldwide public sector organization. He primarily focuses on education desktop, in particular the use of technology to enhance teaching and learning experiences and outcomes. A former head of English, uh, Steve joined Microsoft in 1995 as an education SME on the Encarta team and has been passionately involved in education all his working life. And especially as a parent as well, I think, of yes. six children. You can't avoid it. So um, Kevin Jenkins uh, is global head of learning design at Google. Prior to Google, he has been a school teacher, university academic, professional musician, software startup founder, uh, MIT re research fellow, and has worked extensively in learning technology product innovation. Google's global learning design team is a group of 35 plus learning designers and technologists who develop a wide range of learning solutions and interventions for Google's global workforce. So, thank you. And Eric is over here. Eric Keith has joined uh, LinkedIn in 2009, uh, the third attorney hired into Link LinkedIn. Eric has supported the, the myriad of legal needs of LinkedIn product, especially privacy, uh, which is now primarily focused. Um, he currently leads the company's global privacy program and helps advance LinkedIn's policy, public policy goals from LinkedIn's international headquarters in Dublin. Chantel. Chantel uh, Paulson is a principal at New Schools Venture Fund Oakland office, where she focuses on investment strategy, uh, due diligence and management assistance for the organization's portfolio ventures. Uh, previously, Chantel was a senior engineer, female engineers here today, um, at Procter & Gamble as an Education Pioneers Fellow and Wireless Generation. Chantel has recommended program enhancements for the school of one program based on an analysis of student performance data. Thank you, and Bianca. Uh, Bianca is an enthusiastic uh, primary school teacher who is extremely passionate about the use of educational technology as a pedagogical tool. Bianca works at Griffin Valley Educate Together National School in Lucan and is a member of the Computers in Education Society of Ireland National Executive. Thank you all. So we're going to, I'm going to hand it over to Jake here. We'll take it from there. Thank you. Um, so we've got a, quite a very varied um, panel here, so you've got a lot of different perspectives. So what I might just ask is each of you to spend a few minutes just talking about your sort of vision or perspective of um, future classrooms and as that relates to um, pathways to careers. So I'll start with Stephen in the middle there. Okay, uh, so thanks very much. Um, 
It's interesting, isn't it, when we look at who we talk about the classroom of the future, uh, so much of the, the discussion is still centering on, um, within the context of this uh, organization, the, the notion of technology. And I think something I mentioned earlier I'd like to reiterate, for us it's not about the technology. It doesn't start with the technology. Teaching starts with the teacher, and it starts with pedagogy. It starts with those relationships between teachers and, and among teachers and students. It starts with the practices and ultimately it also comes to the measures. And I think one of the things we look at uh, as being an area of huge interest is what those new measures can be. Because the reality is we will always teach to the measurements. And unless we can find new formative ways of assessing what we would now define as useful outcomes of education, we're not going to see progress. And the other thing I'd say is it's just a reflection on some of the comments I've made earlier. One thing we should probably realize is that nothing we envisage right now is likely to be in a, cl a classroom in 20 years. I was interested that there was a sort of an underlying theme bubbling up earlier about who else should we get into schools? You know, we should get people from business into schools. We should get people from the creative uh, uh, environment to schools, get artists into schools. And I agree about the second and the third of those, but I would kind of remind all of us that we're not part of children's futures. We're already part of their past. The reality is that most of us are working in jobs and maybe even in companies that won't exist when those children leave school. You know, so as we look towards the future, to a degree we're putting a finger in the air, except around the skills themselves. I think we're clear on what those skills have to be. And if we design schools around the students, and if you design measures around the students, it's, it's quite frightening at the moment how much measurement we do or make teachers do, which is about the school as opposed to about the learner, is about the system as opposed to about the learner. But if we put the child at the center of education and really prioritize the things we know will prepare them to become lifelong learners, then, then I'm basically optimistic. If you want to ask me what technologies in terms of devices or services will be in place in schools, the reality is somebody working in Microsoft and probably in Google, we don't know 20 years out how many of the things we're, we are carrying in our pockets or are using on a daily basis actually existed that long ago. But the skills themselves are, are, are key, and the child has to be at the center of that development. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks for that. Um, so, Chantelle? Yeah, so I'll just pick up where you left off. Um, so I think the future is about putting, like you said, the student at the center. And so we're moving towards this classroom of the future that's all about personalization. This classroom of the future where every student is on their own individual learning trajectory, and we have the tools to really understand what they need in real time, and also understand really what interests them. Um, so I see technology really pushing us towards um, allowing students to really explore their own passions, their own interests, and be able to do that through technology um, that's not based on um, getting through a specific grade, but it's, again, it's based on really, really interests them and really, really drives them. Um, I think the future is gonna be less about actually the classroom. So a lot of the learning, um, which we're already seeing now, is taking place outside of the classroom. And so how do we enhance some of those learning experiences where students are learning from each other, they're learning from other experts, they're learning from people in their community? And how do we really um, bring that lifelong learning um, into the classroom? I also think the role of the teacher is gonna change. Um, so I think the teacher, like you said, is still gonna be at the very center of um, a student's learning, but the role of the teacher is really gonna be about understanding what an individual student needs and then being able to differentiate instruction and have the tools um, to provide that right level of instruction. So really, I think the future is all about personalization. Um, again, getting students really more engaged um, in what they're learning and, and being able to learn things that are gonna be relevant for these jobs of the future. I suppose then on to Eric. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I will also pick up where you left <laughs> off. I, I, I think the, the theme of the student at the center and this theme of passion uh, mm. are, are absolutely critical to the future. Um, I don't know how many of you are on LinkedIn. If you are, thank you. If you're not, hopefully, uh, maybe after today we can talk or you'll be inspired to, to go sign up. Uh, but LinkedIn is a, uh, for those of you who don't know, LinkedIn is a, is a platform. It's a platform for professional identity. Uh, we have over 277 million members uh, that are individuals representing themselves to the world as professionals. Uh, they use the platform to connect with other professionals. They use the platform to follow influencers uh, they use the platform to uh, follow companies. Companies are also on, on LinkedIn, and universities are on LinkedIn. And with this massive information of all our members and companies and the interactions, we have, we have begun developing products that are focused on the student. Uh, and I believe, going back to the student-centric and the passion, uh, students will always, and individuals will always, 
go after, learn, <coughs> and pursue what they're passionate about, what they're interested in. Mm -hmm. And so also touching on the theme of lifelong learning. Mm -hmm. uh, if someone is interested, in, if a kid is interested in something, they will, they will find a way to learn as much about it as they can, to develop uh, a business around it, to, to find a way to take it to the next level. So LinkedIn's mission has always been to connect the world's professionals and make them more productive and successful. We've managed to build tools for students to map their careers from an interest, from a what do I want to study, to what does that get me down the road, to who are my role models, how did they get to where they are today? And we can help, not necessarily in a classroom, but at home in conjunction with parents in, in consultative relationships, counseling in terms of careers, what steps a student needs to take. And uh, LinkedIn was founded by a, couple, a number of people, Reid Hoffman in particular, who realized after several failed startups <laughs> and after hitting it big with PayPal that what matters a lot is what you know. But when you add that to who you know, it makes a huge and critical difference. And so, excuse me, so uh, relationships really do matter. And so if you can establish those relationships early in areas that you're passionate about, uh, you know, I think you will find lifelong learning and classrooms can be anywhere. They can be in internships at companies like LinkedIn or Google or Microsoft, or they can be in the classroom, uh, you know, or, or elsewhere. So uh, I look forward to the discussion and uh, thank you. Thanks, Ed. And Bianca? Um, I, I'm, I'm going to go and I'm going to say I'm going to pick up on that as well, and, and I am. Um, I'm Frebel trained, and I suppose my training um, focused on child-centered learning. Um, so that for me is the norm because I don't really know anything different in my own training. Um, how I've ended up sitting here, I'm not too sure. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to admit from the start, I am a newly qualified teacher, but um, one thing I am is very passionate about my job. I love my job. I miss my children today, um, and I hope they miss me. Um, <laughs> but if I think about what is it I think, or where do we go, or I don't have all the big answers, but I tell you what I have. The, People very often come up to me and say, oh, it's great that you're doing this and you're doing that and you're trying this and, and I am getting to do some amazing stuff with some of my children. Uh, I think that comes from, at a very grassroots level, the support from my principal. My principal, although he might not understand what I'm doing, mm -hmm. always says, you know, try it. If it doesn't work, learn from it or, you know, don't do it again. Um, so that's how I've gotten to try some of the stuff I'm doing. Um, and just something I thought of, and, and it might not be from a technological point of view, but a story uh, I'll tell really quickly is I was in school early about two weeks ago and I was listening to a Ken Robinson talk, I don't know if anybody has seen it, and where he spoke about divergent thinking and uh, a study that was done on children where 98% of kindergarten teacher or students were genius level and above average when it came to a lot of the competencies that we're talking about for the future. And then as they moved through school, they lost those competencies. Um, and what was that? It was education that had had squashed it a little bit. So I did that test with my class. I asked them one of the questions he asked them when they came in and, and it turned out they were roughly average to the age that they should be at in his test. And then afterwards I played the clip of the video and showed it to the class. Um, and one of the kids in my class put up his hand and said, why are teachers not fixing that if they know it then? <laughs> and, I, and I said, I really don't know. <laughs> but it's definitely not my job to fix it. I'm only new, but I'm trying, but sure. I, I'm going to a thing in a couple of weeks and I might ask them. Um, so I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> Thanks for the being here. And Kevin? So, uh, as you know, Jake, I'm not going to pick up on anything anybody said and go off at a tangent. Um, <laughs> So um, I, I wouldn't disagree with anything that's been said. In fact, almost everything has been said. So I've got nothing left to say. Um, I think one of the things that's in, uh, uh, that I think about this whole topic is um, most of what we teach in schools actually it doesn't really matter what we teach, I don't think. I think the what is almost irrelevant. Um, now, I say that. I'll qualify that in a minute. But um, for me, it's about the how. And I have an interesting perspective on this in that I've worked in the education system for a long time and then moved into the corporate sector, as, as you have, other people have. Um, and what I see is that the way we ask children to behave in schools is very different from the ways in which we ask them to behave in a working environment. Um, and so uh, examples would be, for example, in my experience in schools, and this may differ in Ireland from other countries, I can't really speak to that, but uh, we, we, do, we ask children to do a lot of work on their own. And when they mm -hmm. go into a working environment, they will almost never work on their own again. 
Um, we ask children to solve rote problems. When they go into a working environment, they'll be presented, presented with very complicated problems that don't have easy solutions. Um, we ask kids to do either very small discrete pieces of work or, or, or very long pieces of work leading to, leading to exams. In, in, in business, you work in projects, you know, that have a beginning, a middle, and end, and a plan. Um, we ask children to take instruction, but we don't ask them to learn how to become autonomous. Um, we never ask them, certainly in the Irish education system, we rarely give them the opportunity to stand up and advocate for something. Um, whereas in business, typically you need to find a project, be the owner, advocate for it with senior leadership, drive it through, put a team around it, you know. Um, so these are the kind of experiences which are necessary to succeed in the working environment, which we don't provide for children in schools. So it's not about technology, right? Mm -hmm. Um, it's about how we do our business. In Google, we typically hire people based on four, there are four broad criteria. So one is role-related knowledge, one is uh, general cognitive ability, one is around leadership, and one is something called Googliness. And if, if you don't know what that is, well, you don't have it, so sorry. <laughs> uh, it's essentially cultural fit. Um, and of those four things, role-related knowledge is by far the least important. We assume you have it. I mean, you can't be an engineer in Google without being an absolutely exceptional engineer, but that's just, that's a necessary but not sufficient mm -hmm. condition. Um, so my question to the education system would be, what opportunities are we giving children to have the kinds of experiences that prepare them for the kind of challenges they'll face in a working life? And it's not about the content. Uh, it's much more holistic. Okay, thanks very much for that. So sort of uh, some commonalities across the, across the board there. Mm -hmm. Um, so I we'll suppose we'll, we'll do is we'll start off with the um, first question and uh, whoever wants to take this first can. Um, so what would you change about a current classroom um, and, and what would you keep about the current classroom? If, if you would at all um, keep it. So I'll, I'll just say one thing to that which is, uh, in, and people in Ireland would be familiar, and this is a comment on secondary education in Ireland more than primary education. In primary education, uh, lots of the time kids sit in groups. Mm. and they face each other. In secondary education, they sit in rows. And so I think, it, certainly at second level in Ireland, the biggest, single, most important change we could make would be to take the seats and point them at each other. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a, it's a, it seems trivial, but actually <laughs> it would completely, radically change everything that was happening in classrooms. So in a way, that's keeping primary school seating, yeah. uh, changing yeah. well, make secondary school. Bigger chairs, seating. obviously, right? But, <laughs> yeah. you know, um, but I think this notion of just sitting, looking at something, it's, it, you, that you fail already. You know? I think one of the things um, I'd like to see change, and it goes back to like what's really expected in the workforce. Um, I think in classrooms too much, and in, in our education system, um, kids are always pushed to do the right answer and get the right answer. Um, and there's not enough uh, push or not enough experiences where children actually experience failure. Um, and a lot of times, especially I come from San Francisco, I live in the Bay Area, um, so live in the middle of kind of the startup ecosystem. And it's all about trying things, iterating, and, and failing, and then learning from those failures. So a lot of times in school, you're not, you know, failures are not appreciated, failures, so students kind of shy away from those hard things. So definitely pushing more experiences um, where students can actually um, fail and then learn from those failures. Um, in terms of what I would keep, um, I think just I would keep um, as much of the kind of collaboration that we can do. Um, I, you know, we can always see more of it, but in terms of just students working together, students working on projects, a lot of the kind of project-based learning and learning from each other, those pieces I would keep. If, if, if I was to call on one thing I think we need to keep, and I, I think it's something that's still here in Ireland but is endangered in a lot of places, and that's the celebration of the teacher. Mm. I, I think we really need to elevate the profession. We need to you know, support the professionals. We need to recognize that they are not the cause of the problem. They are actually passionate advocates for change. Mm -hmm. you know, I lost count of the amount of evenings traveling around Ireland going to education centers at 9 o'clock at night. And it, there would always be a full class of teachers there who come along to find something new that they could take back into their classroom. That energy and that passion needs to be really celebrated and nurtured and then supported with a level of professional development that's required for those teachers to bring new practices and new measures into the classroom to bring about that holistic change. You know, we talk a lot about Finland as an example of, of great education systems. There's one bit which is not rocket science. The top 10% of all graduates in Finland want to be teachers. They want to go into the classroom because the profession is valued, that they're valued as individuals. It's not that they're paid more, 
than their neighbors in Northern Europe. It's that that profession is seen as something really, really powerful and really, really valuable. And the other thing that they've done right in that area is to offer teachers differing career paths. That it's no longer as it was when I was teacher. You, you were a teacher, you might become a head of department, you could become a vice principal and a principal. That's basically it. So two of those roles are teaching. Two of them are middle management and probably the worst job in the world. You know, headmasters have powers that, that dictators only dream of, um, uh, George <laughs> <laughs> Orwell said. Yet, yet they, they, in many cases, they don't have the, the power to promote or reward their best staff and get rid of the staff who are underperforming. So it's, it's a bit of a misnomer. We, we need to celebrate that because when we do that, we see change coming about. And to assume that we can bring about change without bringing teachers with us and giving them the support and, and respecting them, truly respecting them for what they do, you know, we're, we're not going to see change in the way we want to. I, I, would, I would echo that. Coming from the United States, uh, I agree that uh, teachers there, or I would, I would say teachers there, are not uh, held in as high as esteem as they are, for, for example, Finland or, or in Germany. Uh, and I think that, that, uh, that says something. I don't know if it's something good. <laughs> uh, but uh, from, my excuse me, from, from my perspective, uh, what I would like to see uh, in terms of classroom change uh, goes to, to something Chantel said, which is uh, the experience of failure, uh, but I would, I, would, I would phrase it differently. I would say the, 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 the experience of or fostering kind of a, a process-oriented uh, learning where uh, instead of providing content to the, to the students during the class time, use classroom time to collaborate and to solve problems. Um, uh, you know, there are organizations, uh, I think everybody's heard of the Khan, Khan Academy, which is you know, the idea that you can, you can learn the substance or you can get the details on a YouTube video and you can bring that into the classroom and in collaboration with your teacher, you can solve the problems that you learned how to solve and you can do that collaboratively. And that process and that learning by doing uh, makes a huge difference in having the student relate to the subject matter as well as becoming passionate about it. Yeah, and it gives more time. Um, I flipped, I did some research on flipped classroom last year, and I've flipped my geography, history, science classes this year. And it gives us a lot more time to work in class and, and to work on problem solving and to work on the competencies that we're talking about that are, that are the skills of, of the 21st century. And I heard somebody saying recently, um, you know, the textbook and, and the worksheet are the enemies of the skills <coughs> we're talking about, and they are. Um, but what would I keep and what would I change? Sorry, I'm going to answer that as well, if you don't mind. Um, I, would keep, I would keep the peer learning and I would keep the cooperation and the collaboration, but I'd like to make it, I'd like to take that outside the classroom. Mm. Um, and Antisha spoke earlier about bringing broadband to secondary skills. I have broadband in my school, but I don't have Wi-Fi and I don't have resources to use it. So. Uh, like, and that's not trying to. That's not trying to be smart. That's just. That's a fact. Um, if I want Wi-Fi in my class, I bring in my own router. And there's a couple of teachers in the class in the school who have bought their own routers and brought them into the classroom to get a little bit of Wi-Fi going. Um, but we still don't have the resources unless we bring our own devices. And, and I think the outlook uh, needs to change. The the the, the methodology or the ped pedagogy needs to change. Um, because I'd love to make things like peer tutoring and, and cooperative learning, but spread it across the globe. I mean, we looked at, at Mystery Skype this morning. Uh, just take that and, and make something collaborative and make it even across the country. Um, but I think we need to fix, we need to fix some of the, the resource issues and, and the broadband issues and Wi-Fi issues that we, we have and that I have anyway. Um, so the next question is, uh, can you give an example of technology used badly in a classroom setting or in education in general? I can give you one on maybe on a larger scale. Uh, one of the, the, the privileges of the job is that I get to go to a lot of different countries. And I've, I've met with ministers of education both in Thailand and, and in Kenya in recent times. And you probably know that they're both countries who have adopted very large one-to-one -one tablet programs. And, and it does appear from what they're saying and, and from some very open conversations they've had is they're recognizing they've started in the wrong way. They've started with the device. Mm -hmm. And they've run it almost immediately into problems. So in Thailand, what they're doing right now is they're having delivered nearly three quarters of a million tablets. They're locking down their usage. So they're saying to children and to schools, you can't use this more than 90 minutes a day. 
mm. because they can't support it and they haven't got the infrastructure in place and they haven't done the professional development yeah. to, to show people how to use those in an effective way. So what's happened was what looked like a gateway into new way of learning is, uh, has become about control. <laughs> in Kenya, a similar thing has happened. There was a decision made to provide a, 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 you know, upwards of a million laptops without the recognition that 30% of the student population they were addressing were nomadic. So you provide somebody who doesn't know where they're going to live from week to week with a device that needs to be powered up and plugged in and secured, and you almost immediately run into problems. So one thing I'd like to see less of is, is this rush to action focused on the technology and more time and consideration being given about why are we doing this? Uh, and why is this device or any device being brought into the classroom? What are the educational outcomes? And what do we need to do to put the foundations in place to ensure that that technology actually enables improved learning? Yeah, I've seen a lot of um, device one-to-one -one rollouts gone bad. Um, and I think, yes, it's like throw the technology at the problem. Let's just do one-to-one. -one. Let's just throw iPads into the classroom. And no one has a plan. No one knows how to do the implementation. Um, devices are, don't, aren't secure. Um, and teachers aren't supported to do um, the professional development. Um, literally, I've walked into classrooms and people had iPads and they're just sitting in a box. And no one knows how to use them. What do we use them for? Um, so actually, one of the companies that we supported, it's called uh, Nearpod. Um, they saw some of this problem happening. They saw these devices coming to the classroom and teachers not knowing how to adapt their instruction to um, these new devices. And so actually, what they do is they um, synchronize the iPad so that the teacher can do a presentation in real time and students can follow along on the iPad and they can actually embed um, different activities and different assessments. And this just is one way to kind of ease the transition from going from uh, you know, doing presentations um, on the, on the pro uh, projector um, to doing it on the iPad and then helping with that transition. So I think, yeah, I've seen a lot of kind of just rush to put devices in the classroom and um, that not going well. I suppose I'd, I'd add a couple of things. Um, so I, I'm, I'm long enough out of the classroom, I guess, that I don't have specific insight into, <laughs> into the various ways in which technology may or may not be used appropriately or, or effectively. Um, I always felt stuff like ECDL, and I'm not just picking that specifically, but, but there's a danger when you teach sort of software applications that you end up teaching functionality without teaching anything meaningful that can be done with it. And that's not a directed at any particular type of software, but I think that's a mistake that's been made, is let's teach you how to use this piece of software or that piece of software, and then what? And you're, you're, you're not learning computing, and you're not learning about anything else. Um, so, so I guess that's one of the, the, the observations. Another, th another observation would be, um, I mean, Papert, if, if, if people are familiar with Seymour Papert. Yeah. Um, and one of his observations about the way in which education systems co-opt technologies that should drive change and use them to prop up what we do already. Um, and I wonder sometimes are, are you know, smart boards a, an example of that. Mm -hmm. um, my kids came home a while ago talking about an intergalactic whiteboard. Uh, well, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> that's a new generation of smart board that I haven't seen, right? The checker's um, guide. But, uh, you know, so, what, so what's happening now if it's, if, you know, in certain cases, I'm sure mm -hmm. these things can be used well by adventurous teachers and, you know, so. But there is a danger that that copper fastens this notion that there's somebody standing up there pointing at things. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm always wary of technology being co-opted to do whatever it is we're already doing mm -hmm. more of. Um. Go ahead. I, I actually have no particular, I mean, uh, I've, I've seen something similar, uh, my kids coming home and doing uh, exercises on, the, on, the, on, the, on a computer program that, you know, could easily have been done with, with pencil and paper. Yeah, sure. And, yeah. yeah. Why? Yeah. yeah. It's entertaining, I suppose. <laughs> um, I suppose, Stephen, I envy you getting to travel and see other teachers because I think as a profession, we don't get to see other mm -hmm. teachers. Um, so when I got this broad question during the week, I thought to myself, I don't get to see technology being used badly. I hear about it being used badly, but I definitely don't get to see it <laughs> <laughs> being used badly. Um, and and what I would, I'd go back to kind of the point I made earlier about having the resources and being able to use it. Um, a whiteboard on a wall, an interactive whiteboard on a wall being used the same way as a whiteboard on a wall, or a tablet being used as a book or a worksheet. Um, there's, a, there's a really cool picture that floats around on Twitter every so often, and it, it's a picture of, an, of, a, of a tablet with um, boring stuff on this is still boring stuff. Um, and that's true. Um, <laughs> So I think taking the technology and, and, and using it in a, in a, in a better way uh, 
that's that should be people's focus if they have it. If they're lucky enough to have it, um, go and figure out how to use it because um, otherwise it's just a, it's sad. It's a sin. I'll just add one more too. I think um, the other danger is that it can create silos. So you just have students just working on their own devices, and if we're trying to move towards this more collaboration, more peer-to-peer -peer instruction. Um, so I want to see more ways to integrate technology that actually drives that and doesn't drive towards um, students just working more independently on a device. So collaborative use of devices as opposed to... Right. Okay. Um, so we've touched on the skills needed for future industries. Um, could I get each of you to sort of expand on that and how you think... We sort of, you sort of have touched on it, but if I could get you to expand on how you think that should be in the, you know, the classroom of the future, how that should be developed and supported. So could I take maybe just the theme of collaboration, uh, which Kevin brought up earlier? So I mean, one of the great anomalies, is, as he points out, is that everyone recognizes the value of collaborative learning. I think that's, that's, that's everywhere. That's in the secondary school system as well as in the primary school system. But we test individuals competitively at the end of the process. It's extraordinary. You know, we, we, we tell kids from primary school onwards, you need to learn to work together. We, they know, even without us telling them, that when they leave, they go into a job, they'll have to work together. And then at the end of that learning journey, we say, right, you're now competing as individuals directly against everyone else in your class and in the country to get access to a university course to allow you to do that. that, that that's something that uh, sort of jumps out at us all as, as something of an anomaly that we need to address. I, I would say, uh, I think, at least in secondary schools, uh, or even late primary, secondary, eighth, ninth, tenth grades, or class, uh, I think developing, developing skills that allow you to communicate with the outside world, uh, not just putting together reports. I remember when I was uh, in eighth grade, I, uh, we had a, an assignment to write a complaint letter uh, to some product that we had received that was, you know, defective in some way, and and, and many people got, uh, you know, cases of Coca-Cola delivered and in in, in uh, you know recompense and and you know whatever it was, and it, but it was you know how to how to draft a business letter, um, and you know some of these this is actually a very basic skill, and you know coming from at, at LinkedIn, you know we're in the business of not just providing a professional a platform of professional identity, but for helping people find jobs and for helping companies find people for their jobs. And some of these fundamental skills uh, are really necessary. And I think that, that those need to be emphasized. Clear communications. And this goes back to very, this, this goes back to even, even primary school. Um, but I, but, I, but I, I think uh, the value of an introduction, how, how, you, how, you, how, you, how you communicate with, I don't know, a company or uh, an executive, uh, these are all things that can be introduced at a very young age that I think would, would, would benefit uh, uh, students in their future careers. And I also think the idea of thinking, well, what do you want to do? What, what is your future career? What, what, how, can you, how can you take your interest and make that into something you're passionate about, something that you want to grow, that's something you want to make a living with? Uh, these, are all, these are all things that, that I think are not necessarily uh, emphasized and could be. OK, so I'll just build off that. Um, I think it goes a lot to these other skills that are kind of not the non-hard um, skills. Um, some call them non-cognitive skills. I don't like that term. Um, but things like grit, things like persistence um, that we don't really focus on. And when we look at um, kind of who's excelling, who's not, and even if you have two students who are at the very, very similar um, in terms of their technical background, in terms of their hard skill sets. Um, one is going to progress and the other is not. A lot of that comes down to their grit and persistence. And so how do we incorporate being able to um, teach that in school, being able to measure that? Um, I'm seeing a lot of kind of movement towards um, really understanding these skills and really understanding how do we really incorporate them um, into the classroom. So we have um, a company called um, Class Dojo. Um, and right now they've started at kind of more at the behavioral um, system and basically trying to track uh, student behavior. And now they're trying to um, kind of move forward and think about how do we reinforce some of these kind of grit and persistence and these character traits that really um, help students kind of proceed and um, be successful. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. Actually, I, I, was, I was reflecting on what you said earlier about exposing children to the, to the opportunity to fail, which is a very valuable opportunity. Um, and I think giving kids the opportunity to deal with complexity and ambiguity mm -hmm. um, 
and, and, and still finding a way to move forward. There's a great book called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Does anyone know this book? Yeah. Um, it's, it's the sort of book, well, well, when I was in college, you, you, you brought it to the pub and read it prominently in the hope that a hippie chick would happen by. Um, <laughs> trying to look windswept happened. and interesting, right? Never happened. Um, <laughs> But I did get to the end of the book, and he talks about, you know, he, it's a philosophical treatise, you know, located in the context of assembling and disassembling motorcycle engines. And this concept of you, you disassemble the engine, and if anyone has ever done that, and, and put it back together, and found you had a spring. And not knowing how critical that spring was, and whether you should or shouldn't get on the motorbike again, right? That's a, that's a big decision in your life. Um, and this notion of being stuck. Stuckness is an interesting notion. Um, and you can't learn unless you first get yourself stuck. And actually, you could think about the, the whole purpose of the education system and teachers and everything in it is to get kids stuck, actually, at one level. Um, so giving kids the opportunity to face complexity and ambiguity, get stuck, and then figure out a way forward. I think, I, I think that's something we, we could do a much better job of and would really be, to your point, character building. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, I think teaching children to have a point hear someone else's point and know that it's okay to change their point of view. Um, I think that's an important one. Uh, I think I'm thinking of a group in my class only yesterday who um, started working together on a, on a group project and the task was um, redevelop something, create something, invent something, make something, do something, off you go. Um, and one of them came back to me after a little while and said, you know, four of us want to do this, but one person wants to do that. And I said, well, that's going to happen to you for the rest of your life, so you need to figure out how to figure that out. And she said, well, can you not just talk to her? And I said, no, I'm not in, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not in your group. Um, and they, off they went. Now, they still haven't got a plan, but I'm sure that the sub who's in with them today is, is figuring that one out with them. Um, but that's one thing I think... Being able to have an opinion and being able to change it, and um, being able to hear someone else's and know it's okay, even if you've screamed from the rooftops about your first opinion, to say actually, you know, I, I like this one now and, I, and I've changed a little bit. Um, I think they're moving into a world that's going to be extremely, extremely fast and to learn how to uh, equip them to deal with a fast pacing, globalized society, um, while at the same time being able to maintain some sort of cultural identity and, 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 and live in the world they're in. Um, but yeah, no, I think just being able to adapt and being able to be creative and be able to work together and a lot of what people have just said here already. Thanks for that, guys. Um, so what I'll do is I'll open it up to the floor. Um, I think this man has been wanting to ask a question for a while. How do you do? Uh, Michael here from an educational design company called Exploratory, who will be launching hopefully next uh, March or April. Um, the question is, just leading on from the last, question, last uh, discussion, this idea of collaboration of the kids uh, facing each other in the classroom. Mm -hmm. From your own pedagogical point of view and history and understanding how this works, um, what's more important is that they work on real things in the classroom that they can touch, that's malleable, that is shapeable. Or is it the virtual world that's been pressed upon us now, the connection through Skype phone calls and as such, is that equally important, or is, is, there, is there a tier of importance in terms of the learning that you can get from kids when they're in a classroom setting, uh, working on objects that are in the class in the physical space? Who wants to take that? Um, I don't think any, any of this is either or. I think one of the things we've known for a long time is that there are different learning styles. You know, I always reflect, any time we go to an event like this, what percentage of the people in the room are being engaged in the way that they learn best? You know, we have visual learners, we have aural learners, we have kinesthetic learners, and we have mixed learners. And in general, we don't appeal to all of those types. And I, I absolutely take your point. We've got to incorporate all of those different modalities as we teach. But one of the things that fascinates me is, is the part to which you know, teachers and students and parents and outside influences will start to design schools. Because at the moment, I think that schools are something that's given to us and we inherit the model. We are losing students. Students are opting out of schools. Let's be honest about this. You know, 47% of kids in high school in 2012 who left school said they, didn't, they did it not because they were failing, but because school was failing them. And unless we incorporate them into the design of the school and ask them the question, well, what works best for you? and you, and you, and you, and make sure all of those modalities are included, then we're not going to end up with a really holistic uh, um, environment. I think parents are, is, is also an interesting touch to, uh, point to touch on. Parents are often seen as be being a problem. 
You know, they're the holders of the gold standard. They're the people who went through the existing system and therefore don't want the existing system to change. But are they really being brought into the discussion? Are we really including them in the discussion about what's going to happen with their children's education? And how can they help to shape and design it? I think those things are going to become much more important if we're going to end up with a sort of immersive learning experience as you're describing. One piece I heard in your question was something about, you know, to what extent, and, and I guess this is at the core of what, what a classroom is, um, to what extent do we need to bring groups of people together to do mm -hmm. stuff together in the same place at the same time? And it's interesting, I mean, so in Google, I mean, I run a distributed global team, as you know, potentially some of you guys do, um, and we have excellent infrastructure. We have always on video conferencing, drop of a hat, can be, you know, conferenced into anything with anyone, anywhere, anytime. But even still, we spend hundreds of millions flying people around from one place to another because there are certain kinds of things that we feel can only be done by people being in a room together. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I wouldn't like to articulate fully what some of those things are, but certainly, you mm -hmm. know, when it gets into creative brainstorming, mm -hmm. um, that's something that's very hard to do at distance. So I think there's a, you know, is it possible to have a distributed classroom? Well, you, you, you'll gain something, certainly, but you also maybe risk losing some sense of community. And there are various technologies that would claim to, you know, ameliorate against that. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. Um, but you also lose something about the immediacy of the interaction. You do something and I respond to it immediately in the moment. And out of a group of people doing that, who knows what will emerge. It's much harder to broker, in my experience, those kinds of interactions at distance. Not impossible, but harder. And so I think that's the challenge in terms of, if we think about a classroom breaking up and becoming distributed, is trying to be aware of what we potentially could lose um, and how to sort of uh, mitigate against that. Mm -hmm. But I'll just add too, I think the balance piece is important in actually introducing that early on because like you said, we all kind of work in that environment now. Um, so I'm on conference calls, I'm on video calls, and if I didn't know how to do that effectively, um, that could be a problem. So I think it is important to introduce kind of virtual world. What is the best um, behavior when you're on a video call versus on how do you read people's behavior, how do you, how do you read their tone, how do you read the tone of email? So all those kind of new behaviors that is gonna, what you're going to face in the workforce, I think it's important to kind of introduce that early on. And I think as a teacher, um, you try and need to, well, I try and find a balance. Um, something that just occurred to me there when you were speaking about the, the, the virtual and the physical. Um, our school are lucky enough to be having a new building built at the moment, and, and the plans for the building were, were in the hallway for anybody and everybody to walk in, a very open door policy in our school. And um, lots of people have, I'm sure, stopped to look at it, but lots of people really just floated past and said, oh, that's the new building. Um, one of the children in my class asked me, could he build the new building in Minecraft? And could they do it together? And I said, sure. Um, <laughs> let, let's bring our principal on a virtual tour of the building that he's just worked for months and months with, with a group of builders to design and let him see what it looked like, in your opinion, based on the plans. Um, so I think it's finding a balance. And I think there's children that, in that group that worked on that, that stood up and spoke and presented that, and that's what they were very good at. There was children who built it and had no interest in standing and speaking and presenting about it. Mm -hmm. And um, there was kids that helped from the side. And I think it's, it's just as a teacher trying to find projects that will incorporate a whole lot of it. Because um, I don't think any of it is more important than the other, no. Good, thanks for the guys. Is there any? Hi, uh, Claire Keneally from Bridge 21. Um, and our work involves um, developing learning and teaching models for the future classroom um, and we work with um, a number of fantastic schools around the country some of whom are represented uh, in this session here today um, and the first thing that we start with and i'm really glad you mentioned it kevin is just getting them to change the desks in their classrooms and seeing what happens um, and they have an expectation that bridge 21 is about technology and learning and they're wondering why are you starting with the desks but um, it, it's got to be the first thing we change but my question is around the role of leadership um, and Bianca, you touched on it. Um, you have a principal who clearly has, uh, maybe doesn't know what you're, what you're doing all the time, but you're, you're getting their support um, and they have some sort of a vision for, for, for what they want to happen in their school. Um, and so my question is, what is the role of principals in future classrooms and future schools? Um, and maybe to flip that slightly then, Maybe it's not down to the principals, but what's the role of leadership um, and how do we foster it in our teachers? And um, something that was raised earlier in a session by Sean O'Sullivan about building it from the ground up. So it's about the role of leadership, I guess, in general in future classrooms. Um, yeah, um, I am very lucky. Um, as I said earlier, I'm a newly qualified teacher and a lot of my 
colleagues from college um, are, might ring me and ask me advice on something. Um, I went back as a mature student, so I am the mammy of the group, and, uh, and they ring me and ask me advice. And, my, and I very often say, why don't you ask your principal? Because surely it depends from school to school. And very often the answer I get is, oh, I don't want them to know that I don't know. And, and, and you know, you can't really knock in and ask. So I think an open door policy, I have no fear of, of knocking on my principal's door. In fact, it's usually open. Um, so I think people being able to walk in and, and there's so many teachers in schools and children and parents who have a passion for something that they really, really, really enjoy and don't put their hand up and say, you know, I could do this or can I do this because they're afraid to ask. So I think confidence in teachers, confidence in teachers to look in a class and have the autonomy to say, um, I'd, I'd love to change this and it's going to work in my class and why. And, and just to go back to the furniture, I love round tables with wheels, um, lockable wheels with smart paint on top of them, if anybody wants to invest in them. <laughs> um, that's what I'd like. Um, the, the, the notion of leadership is interesting. Um, and again, I'll give the Google example. I mean, in Google, you walk into a meeting of 10 people, you typically have no idea who's actually the boss there. It, it tends to be very egalitarian, and whoever is in charge is the person who happens to be leading that particular thing. And the person who is actually the boss will sit back and let that person lead and do what they're told frequently or asked to as part of making a contribution to whatever the particular initiative is. Um, so that's one angle. I think education systems tend to be very conservative, so it's very hard to drive change into education systems. Um, and to your point, you know, how do, we, how do we enable that change to happen in terms of a sort of a bottom-up perspective? So, so I'd connect two things. I would say, how do we enable schools to pull in the various innovative things that are happening around the edges, things like Code or Dojo and so on and so forth? And how do we empower teachers to be leaders and drive those things into the system? And that's really the challenge for me. It's not about top-down leadership. It's not about the principal being a leader. It's about a person who has a vision or an idea who wants to drive it and lead it through the system. How do we empower them and facilitate them to do that? Does anyone else want to come? To no, just, just I think that to, to come on, uh, to come up and, and, and supporting what Kevin is saying is that leadership is modelled as well, but also leadership has to be supported. You know, I think that the days of the principal being God Almighty, and I taught under at least two of them, um, are, are pretty much gone. And that's a good thing for them too. I don't think anyone was ever comfortable with owning every decision and, own, and having to carry the can and everything. I think we're seeing much more distributed leadership within schools. I think that's becoming the norm. But I think there's also a responsibility for us in industry, um, for parents, um, for the broader communities to re-establish the student as the leader in the education process. Ultimately, it's for them. It's not for anybody else. And they, too, need to develop the skills of leadership. I am a dreaded principal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm principal. I have the very, very pleasant job of being principal of the International School of Dublin, which is a primary school. Excuse my voice, sorry. <laughs> Too much teaching. Um, I, how do we change people's perception about learning from an early age? We take children in full time from the age of three. We follow the international baccalaureate curriculum. Um, we don't have textbooks. We have modal furniture that moves continually. I hear it over my head the whole time, depending on whatever's being investigated. We have units of inquiry that last for six weeks. Um, we start this at the age of three. How do we get industry to understand that being a three-year-old in school is really important. They're not there just for the parents to go, ah, oh, sure, they're happy. We take them out, we, we interact with the community, we have what we call open classrooms. So if you're learning about mammals, you will go out and you'll meet with the Dogs Trust and you'll go to the zoo, but you will interrogate the zoo to find out why some of their enclosures don't match the natural habitat of those animal, animals. And at three, year, three years old and four years old, they're taught to actually be able to have the confidence to challenge people and say, but we've learned this, why is it like that? How do we change people's perception that education is so key right from the beginning? If we don't get it right from three, you've lost them. Just a, one piece of research, if you don't mind me commenting on it. I met with uh, the head of brain science in, in, um, 
in University of Washington, and you know, of course replied, it's not rocket science, but there you go. Um, she's an incredibly bright woman, but she's written a number of papers about people's ability to, to gain knowledge and absorb learning. And 95% of our learning potential is over by the time we're five, mm -hmm. which is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. So by the time we left with that last 5%, we then go to school and begin learning. So I think you've hit on something really interesting. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the barriers that we've imposed on you know, when school starts and when it ends, either within a day or within a life, you know, how we group people by age or by ability, all of those barriers are going to have to disappear if we're going to actually harness the power, particularly in, in really young learners. Yeah. I think also there's, a, there's an element, and a lot of what I'm hearing today is that people's expectation is too low. That mm -hmm. our students, from the day they come in, are expected to give presentations. At the end of their six week unit, they decide as a cohort how they're going to present and share their learning with their parents. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, so they're used to giving presentations. Communication is the key. Mm -hmm. Our curriculum is completely skill driven, skill and concept driven. There is no concept. I'll just say first, I commend you on what you're doing. I think that's fantastic. And um, I think there is a lot of research out there. So you're saying, we have all this research. We know it's important. Why, is not, why, why, why are people not moving? So I think um, what we need are the proof points. And you have that. So you have a proof point where you're showing we have three-year-olds who are doing presentations. And I think just accelerating that, those proof points and I think just um, highlighting that it's working, I think that'll also drive change. So I think kind of beyond the research is actually having um, great proof points and models of what, what does, what can happen. It's hard for us because yeah. it's small. So yeah. to try and chip away and say, hello, we're yeah, hello. what we're doing. <laughs> yeah. you know, I, I train teachers around the world, but I don't train teachers in Ireland. Mm. Um, you know, it is a worldwide proven mm -hmm. curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's hard here to try and chip in and, mm. and find people who say, yeah, come and look at come what, look what we're doing. doing. Yeah. We are open. Yeah, okay, come and see us. <laughs> see I actually taught in an IB school in San Francisco. For a year, which mm -hmm. I thought was a, it was a really eye-opening experience. Actually, it's a completely different take on it. And I remember it, this was a high school, so it was it was older kids. But at the core of the curriculum was something called theory of knowledge, which, as I understood, it was a combination of philosophy and psychology, essentially, um, and, and and various other pieces. But the, the the thrust of that was, we're not going to teach you stuff. We're going to teach you how to think, and we're going to look at how other people have, you know, thought in the past and models for thinking and, and being, um, as a core that would enable you to explore all kinds of other things. And I always thought that was a really interesting take on it, to make that primary and, and, and central, you know, a sort of metacognitive aspect. It was very interesting. We're going to give you another wee minute just to round up. We're going to get your brains thinking. Uh, on Blue Skies, what the classroom will be like in the future. So give you all a wee chance so you're thinking of that. I just want to... I mean, what we've heard today is brilliant in this morning um, on the education. I love Celebrate Teachers. I just love that. Um, that'll be all over Twitter. And I am coming from Northern Ireland, and our curriculum is a bit different um, up there. Um, we've got good things. One of the good things is we have a, a, a topic or a part of the curriculum called PDMU, which is Personal Development Mutual Understanding, and that comes from us having the troubles, unfortunately. So, but from that, we have to celebrate every child and who they are. Um, and where they come from in the community um, and stuff. So that, a great way of doing that is projects. Um, and like you had mentioned earlier, Steve, about projects in schools. And, you know, I could point out, and I'm going to do it, I'm going to be real cheeky, and like Sentinus in Northern Ireland, they do projects in schools. Uh, we have Culture Tech doing projects, Go Berserk doing projects in schools, and uh, the Nerve Centre make desks for the schools. In fact, the kids make the desks with no with wheels in fab lab and you know we're learning we we sort of think oh we're getting there and then you go to america and you see where things are happening there and then you hear all this and we've got so much more to do and we kind of all collaborate together uh, on the car yesterday on the way down there's five of us and we were going back to take on dairy and then we come here with so much more information so thank you so much for everything that you've given and shared here from the audience so on that now we're going to leave you with uh, one minute each on what the future classroom would look like? That's a giant question. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm going to pick up on what you just said there. Um, I was in Derry recently at a conference and I dropped into the Fab Lab by accident um, because someone in the bar the night before said, you should go and visit this place next door. Uh, and I walked in saying, so, somebody told me I should come in here. Um, and Eamon, who's sitting there, um, very nicely 
spoke to me um, for longer than he probably expected to. Uh, he couldn't get rid of me, in fact. Um, but I would love to see an element of what they're doing in Fab Lab being brought into schools. Um, I, it blew my mind there. Uh, I tend to go back, and, and if it, and nobody knows what it is, you should check it out. Um, so incorporating the element of fabrication and, and, and design into um, what we're doing. I also heard when I was in Derry about STEM and, and STEM being adapted into STEAM and, and bringing the arts and, and the design element of things into STEM-based subjects because, you know, you might be able to, to design it and engineer it, but the creative aspect of it has been, has been left out. And if you can't artistically develop something or create it or have a vision, then, then maybe you won't develop it or, or create it. So I'd love to see that happening. Um, that, so my trip to Derry was fantastic, um, just to say. And, yeah, and, and, and people spoke this morning about personalised learning. And I think personalised learning is, is where we need to go. And I don't know how we get there, because um, I'm not the leader there. <laughs> Somebody else needs to do that one. Um, I don't know if I have a good sense of what, what the classroom of the future means. I mean, when you start to think about, to, to your point earlier, I mean, or whoever said, you know, we don't know what technology is going to be like in five years. I mean, I, I moved back from California in 2000, and when I got off the plane, I didn't have a mobile phone, and there was no internet connection in my house. Um, and here we are. Um, I, I, what, what's the guy? Is it Kevin Warwick, the guy who does the cyborg research? I mean, you know, so that, you know, it's not beyond the bounds of possibility that at some point we'll all have chips in our brains and whatever knowledge we need will be, you know, or at the very least we'll have some massively extended version of Google Glass that can call up all the information we ever need in front of us. It's not beyond the bounds of, po the bounds of possibility that at some point, in fact, I think it's highly likely that at some point, large numbers of people will be recording on camera everything they do every day and storing it somewhere. That's, that's not that far away. So, so I think assumptions we make about the nature of knowledge and learning and the world are going to be so radically changed by technology over the next 20 or 30 years that it's, it's almost impossible to predict. I mean, you know, almost every surface in this room could be enabled in some way or other. What, what effect does that have? The classroom becomes everything. We did um, discuss it after this morning. We heard about uh, the registration taking up 15 minutes. And, you know, you could pros and cons of that. And we did suggest the children would be chipped when they come through the room, just <laughs> beep, 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 scan. Yeah almost a lesson but I do think that removes a lot of the sort of pedagogy then of circle time and you know how are you feeling today are you lunch or dinner you know so there's a balance so we'll not chip them yet <laughs> yeah but, but I think that you're, you're right I mean uh, you know what do you lose and what do you gain I mean yeah. the, the interaction is you know I mean we're even seeing it now right up to third level I mean you know the third level institutions used to be the holders of knowledge we're sorry all that information is not knowledge because knowledge resides in a person it's information and it's all free so now what are you going to do you know, um, so so I think we're going to see those kind of changes. Thank you. So I, I'm just on that point. I'm wearing my chip right now. Okay. I have a Fitbit. I have a Fitbit, right? Yeah. I mean, what, they they have these things in hospitals where they keep track of patients, so that you know that when someone wanders off to the floor below or to find them. I mean, it doesn't have to be a, a scanner. They use yeah. them in marathons. Yeah. You know? So anyway. It's a big sorry. topic. Yeah. That's just a reflection that my, my brother, um, my younger brother, worked uh, for Rank Xerox years ago and he was a salesperson and they ran a, a competition every month and they would kill each other to outsell each other. And then one month they had this terrible dip in sales and they, they tried to find out why. It's because the prize was a thing called a mobile phone. And uh, as my brother said, it's, God, who wants one of them? Your boss could get you any time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so things, things change quickly and rapidly. You know, if I look forward, I suppose, as an optimist, I think a number of things I think we can probably take are pretty self-evident. For a start, school will be one of the places in which learning will take place. It's already the case. Learning takes place without schools, without teachers. Um, secondly, everyone on the planet will have some form of mobile device which allows them to learn any time, any place. Mm -hmm. Because that's already happening. The proliferation of the mobile phone in the developing world proves that that's the case. As an optimist, I'd like to think that what we'll see in the classroom in the future is, first of all, freedom from boring tasks to, uh, to allow teachers to go back to teach, to do the thing they do best and most creatively. And lastly, my hope would be that we would walk into classrooms of 18-year-olds where you'll see the same enthusiasm, the same joy and creativity that you see in a class of three-year-olds. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, I'll just echo, I think the classroom is going to be much broader than the school. So there'll be, you know, class will be going to a job, class will be your community. Um, but I also think there's going to be a lot more global connections. And I think um, students are going to be, become the teachers, become, going to become the experts. 
um, and going to be helping students from all over the world um, learn. I, I agree with everything uh, that everybody <laughs> said. Uh, I would also say that integration with uh, schools, classrooms, integration with uh, businesses and enterprises uh, everywhere. Yeah. Um, I think especially once you get into secondary school, 14, 15 years old, you're looking to university perhaps, you're looking to some sort of job, some sort of career, you're going to need some skill set that may not involve uh, you know, what you're learning in the classroom. You may need to learn how to, I don't know, build hydraulic yeah. systems or something like that. Uh, and this goes to the discussion around you know, valuing teachers, valuing trades as you would uh, a professional. Uh, and so I think the classroom does expand. I think it goes beyond the, the, the walls of the school. It goes, it goes into the community and beyond, and um, there's, there's no doubt that that's, that's uh, what, and technology, of course, will just accelerate that, so. Yeah. Thank you. Um, well, we're there, we're gonna close, and um, just on that last note, I had uh, your photograph, Steve, of um, the blacksmith and the child, right? and, and I see myself as that. I'm an engineer, and granted, there are not too many, female engineer Chantel, and you know, that is changing. But my father is an electrician, and I'm in doubt with him, you know, mainly because there were six of us and they had to take one with them. And, and that's why, so a parents, I, I love that. Celebrate the teacher and parents um, from what she's came today. So thank you. Thank you, everybody.